Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from across the world. Our headlines Activist Safura Zargar granted bail in India, Algerian activists sentenced to a year in prison for calling for protest, Palestinians protest in Jericho, joined by UN special envoys and foreign ambassadors, Afghan government accuses Taliban of attacks, and US flags four more China and Chinese media outlets as foreign missions. We start with India, where Delhi-based activist and student Zafura Zargar has been granted bail under humanitarian grounds. Zargar, who has been in detention for over two and a half months, is five months pregnant. She had been charged under draconian laws on charges of conspiracy in connection to riots that broke out in Delhi in February. The violence took place amid protests against India's divisive citizenship law. The riots were preceded by many provocative statements by leaders and those associated with the ruling Hindu right-wing Bharatiya Janata Party. During the violence too, a majority of those affected were Muslims. But in the investigation, the Delhi police has focused on activists who are organizing the protests against the citizenship law. The police have sought to build a case claiming that many of these activists who were engaged in peaceful protests were in fact the masterminds of the violence. 27-year-old Safura Zargar is one of these activists. Her arrest and prolonged detention at a time when she was pregnant and that too amid the COVID-19 pandemic was severely criticized by various sections of society and activists. She was denied bail on an earlier occasion. Meanwhile, the family of jailed Indian activist Gautam Navlaka said that he is being kept under deplorable conditions in Mumbai in Western India. 68-year-old Gautam Navlaka was arrested in April in a case which many experts have said is weak and is only meant to stifle dissent. On Monday, Navlaka's partner Saiba Hussain said that he was lodged in a quarantine facility in the outskirts of Mumbai where prisoners are lodged before they are shifted to prison. Over 350 inmates have been crowded into six classrooms and Gautam himself is sharing a room with 35 inmates. This makes any concept of physical distancing virtually impossible. In a phone call, Navalaka told her that due to, a, due to the extreme congestion, inmates are prone to skin infections and other complications. In three weeks of quarantine, Navalaka was already unwell has further lost weight, Saiba Hussain said. Gautam Navalaka is on trail, trial in what is known as the Elgar Parishad case. The issue began with Hindu right-wing violence in 2018, but the case was soon transformed into yet again a supposed conspiracy by activists and critics of the government. In addition to Navlaka, 10 prominent human rights activists and scholars are in prison in the case. One of them, iconic poet and activist Varavar Rao, is in extremely poor state of health after close to two years of imprisonment. In our next story, Amira Burawi, a prominent face of the Hirak movement in Algeria, was convicted and sentenced to a year in prison on Monday. She has been found guilty by a court on six counts, including insulting the president, insulting Islam, incitement to violate lockdown and for allegedly pub publishing fake news. Burawi was arrested from her home on June 17th for a Facebook post where she called for the resumption of weekly Hirak protests. She was previously associated with the Barakat, that's That Enough movement, that fought for political reforms and inclusion of the Berber minorities in the Algerian mainstream. The 44-year-old is a gynecologist by profession. Her lawyer expressed his disappointment with the judgment and said that they would appeal it in the higher courts. The Hirak movement came up in February 2019 to oppose the fifth term bid of the then President Abdulaziz Bouteflika. He finally resigned in April 2019. But the protests have continued demanding an overhaul of the Algerian political system which has been in existence since liberation from France in 1962. On Friday, hundreds turned out to resume the weekly protests. The police and security persons used force and arrested more than 500 people. Though most of them were released later, a large number were also sent to jail. In our next story, thousands of Palestinians took part in a protest in Jericho in the occupied West Bank on Monday. The protests were against the proposed Israeli plan to annex parts of the West Bank. The protest was organized by the Palestinian Authority under its Popular Activities Program to oppose the annexation. The protesters were joined by the United Nations Peace Envoy for the Middle East, Nikolai Malinov, and representatives from China, Russia, the European Union, Britain and Jordan. Some of these delegates spoke in the meeting and reiterated, reiterated their support for the two-state solution and vowed to oppose the Israeli plan. Though a large number of Palestinians were stopped by the Israeli forces at checkpoints preventing them from participating, thousands of others defied these attempts and joined from various parts of the occupied West Bank. Israel's new coalition government, headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, has announced that it will start the process of extending Israeli sovereignty over occupied Palestinian lands from July 1st. We now go to Afghanistan, where amid the intra-Afghan peace talks that were scheduled for later this month in Qatar, the Afghan government led by Ashraf Ghani noted that last week was the bloodiest in the country's 19 years of fighting. They pointed out that 422 attacks were carried out by the Taliban insurgents, leading to over 700 casualties. 
according to the National Security Council. The attacks were carried out in 32 provinces and left 291 government troops dead and 550 critically injured. However, the Taliban rejected the claims made by the National Security Council and said that uh, these attacks did not take place. It also said that writing or reporting such statements could damage the negotiation process. The latest attack took place in Kabul's Deh Sabz district on June 22nd, in which five employees of the Attorney General's office lost their lives. All of them were travelling in a vehicle at the time of the attack. And finally, on Monday, the US added four more Chinese state-owned news outlets and broadcasters to a list of foreign missions from China. The outlets include China Central Television or CCTV, China News Service, The People's Daily and Global Times. The move will require these media outlets to submit their list of employees and all their transactions to the US State Department. The reclassification will limit their access to reporting and media passes and they will be dealt with as Chinese propaganda missions. The reclassification also implies that the US can limit their staff intake and transactions as and when needed. The US has argued that the move is valid because of these organizations' association with the Communist Party of China and the central government. The China has decried the move as an attempt at politically suppressing Chinese media in the US and has warned of retaliation. Previously in March, the US did the same with five other news organizations from China that were operating in the country. That's all we have in this episode of the International Daily Roundup. We'll be back tomorrow with more developments from across the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,